John, welcome at Slush. Is this your first Slush? It is my first Slush. What do you think so far? Um, it's crowded. Um, no, it's great so far. Um, un unbelievably cool people. Um, great people. Um, lots of people I know. It seems like uh, Helsinki is the new center of the universe, so it's a good time to be here. Awesome. So for, for the few people that don't know who you are and your professional background, can you quickly give us the highlights of your professional career? Uh, I'm not sure there are highlights, but um, I think for most people it's slush. The most relevant thing is the microphone is fun, but um, the most relevant thing is that um, I used to be the CEO of Electronic Arts, um, you know, worked in the game industry for the last 15 years, um, have a lot of experience in investing in digital technology and entertainment. I founded a private equity fund with a number of partners called Elevation Partners, and I'm back in investing again now. I was just going to ask what you do now, but does that mean you actually started a new private equity firm or a new fund, or is it just angel investment, You're just having fun? Well, right now I'm investing on my own, and then in combination with a number of with venture and private equity firms. Um, may do a fund, but at the moment it's more about individual projects, which gives me an opportunity to learn more about young entrepreneurs, which I'm having a lot of fun with. So you, you've actually made this transition before, because you were at EA from um, 97 to 2004, I believe, yeah. when you joined or started Elevation Partners with um, Bono and Roger McNamee and other people. Um, and then you rejoined uh, Electronic Arts as CEO in 2007? Yeah. Is that correct? Um, so do you see yourself going the investment route uh, for the rest of the, your tenure, or do you see, see yourself returning to an executive role at a gaming company at some point? Look, I think that um, for me, the love is of game, games, technology, consumer technology. Um, it's great being an operator. I've been an operator um, running businesses really for, you know, I graduated from college in 1981. Most of the people hearing this weren't born yet. Um, so that's 32 years. Um, of the 32 years, I've spent 26 years as an operator. Investing is a similar thing, but it's not exactly the same. It's fun to have a different angle. It's, and to be able to mentor younger um, CEOs is also fun. So as we mentioned, you were at, um, the first time you joined EA as a president and CEO was in 97. So you've seen a lot of uh, the transitions uh, in the gaming industry, um, especially when you rejoined in 2007. There was a whole digital transformation. There was a move from packaged goods going to online. Mobile was starting. Um, so how do you look back at that period now? Well, look, I mean, one way to look back at it is um, back then there were four companies making sports games. THQ, Midway, Acclaim, and EA. Um, three out of four stayed with packaged goods and three out of four are gone or bankrupt. Um, in that same time frame, and that's not a fair comparison because EA competed with lots of companies, not just those three, but um, we had a very, very tiny digital business and we invested heavily to create a leading digital business and in 2012, I'm really proud of a couple of things. One is, if you look at things like Metacritic for game quality, that's one thing to look at. Um, EA had the highest Metacritic average of any major publisher. Five years earlier, we were not in the top 10. Five years later, we were number one. Five years earlier, on a global basis, we were not in the top 30 for digital content makers. In 2012, we were number one. Good progress. A billion seven in revenue there was hard to get to, but it happened. Um, not easy, not always in ways we imagined. Um, change is hard and it doesn't always work the way you imagine. But I'm really proud of a team and there's great people leading it now and I think they're going to continue to be successful. Great, thank you. Um, so you, were, you gave a presentation about half an hour ago. Um, I know it's hard, but can you quickly summarize in a few um, key highlights what you talked about? Well, look, I, I, I made a bit of a joke in my presentation about insulting everyone through my five wishes. And saying fuck. What's that? And saying fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but what I was getting at was this, that too many people right now are trying to say, calm down, the change is done. And that's just not true. You know, the console platform makers, you know, Sony and Microsoft are talking about trying to reassure current gamers or current console gamers, yes, you'll have your packaged goods. You know, no, we're not going to require online authentication. Yes, we're going to support second sale. 
Yes, we're going to continue to have a premium $59 package price point. Yes, you're going to continue to get five gigs on a disk. Guess what? None of that's true. So um, there, it's true to a degree, but it's all going to change. And so I, I was encouraging people, whether it's guys like Sony or Microsoft, or it's Supercell and King, embrace change because right now, the only way to stay on top or to stay in the lead is to change aggressively with a market that's transforming before our eyes. It's a great time if you act boldly. And that was really the principle of my talk. Um, you were always pretty outspoken about the trends you saw in the, the gaming industry and the changes. Um, but since you left, you gave a very interesting long interview at Games Industry, which I've very interestingly, interestingly been reading for uh, past two days in preparation. And one of the things you mentioned, and you also mentioned this on stage, is you questioned the inability for a lot of the mobile game developers and publishers out there to build lasting brands. And we're in the hometown of um, Supercell and Rovio. Um, and many people are asking, um, especially outsiders, um, can they build lasting brands that go on for 15, 20 years, even longer? So what I was pointing out is franchises like Mario are 34 years old, Madden 25 years old, FIFA 20 years old, The Sims 13 years old, Call of Duty 11 or 12 years old, Assassin's Creed 11 or 12 years, no, 13, 14 years old. And if you look at the top console and PC brands, they've all accrued revenues of over $10 billion, making them five of the top entertainment brands in the history of entertainment. By the way, last year, five games outgrossed the number one movie in the world. The top five games, actually the top 11 games, outgrossed the Super Bowl. So people don't realize how big these things are and how long they've lived. That is really the essence of a brand. There's a lot of other things you can get into. What I worry about with the mobile business is they're making great products but they're not yet bold enough to create great brands. And I'm guilty of having made this mistake. So um, the team behind Bejeweled, they make a great product. They wanted to continue to make that great product, but then Candy Crush innovated on that product and built a much bigger business. And I'm sure you know, the guys at Kixai wish they had innovated with you know, Backyard Monsters in the way that Clash of Clans did. And my point was this on stage, that Somebody is going to innovate over Candy Crush or Clash of Clans unless they do it themselves. And one of the problems or challenges with mobile is the entire team, the marketing team and the development team, is focused on sort of acquisition funnel marketing and continued creation of features and additions to their game to keep their existing engagement high and their existing monetization high. And they're making small changes, one inch at a time, every day, to keep that audience engaged. Somebody else gets to look at them and say, they're going on a line, they're going in a direction, I can jump a year ahead of them. And given how fast technology has moved, they will and they will beat them. And one of the things that's going to be, is yet to be seen, will a top five mobile brand put out a 2.0 or a product that is, that's designed to eat their own lunch, to take their own audience and move them to another experience in a way that's shocking. Can you, I mean, when I go back to most of the mobile games I play, it's very familiar. I've been playing the same damn game for 150, 300, 400 days. Wouldn't it be interesting if I turned it on one day and it was brand new? And only through that kind of challenge and taking that kind of risk will these things be alive in a decade or two. And that was the point. I wasn't criticizing them. They make great products. But creating great brands with the landscape changing as much as it is in gaming means they're going to have to embrace more change, more risk. Time will tell. Um, shifting the discussion to consoles, um, you, and not everyone agrees with you on this, um, you're still a big believer in consoles and console games and big franchises. Um, so what, what evolution do you see in the next five years in terms well, of look, console? What I believe in, and um, you know, I think it's kind of silly when people say that console gaming is going away, because the biggest screen in the household is your television set. People are buying ever larger television sets. They've got you know, you know, 2K, 4K screens, you know, ultra high definition, et cetera. That device is going to get used. And so the point I'm trying to make is 
maybe it won't be a console from Sony or Microsoft that puts the, uses that screen. Maybe it'll be a steroided out tablet from Samsung. But by this point, they've got a controller stuck into the side of it. It's got a 500 gig memory, and it's running 128 bit architecture. Guess what? It's a console. So my point isn't that um, something is magic about Microsoft and Sony. No one company or two companies owns tomorrow. They're going to have to innovate. But you know, right now, the idea that big games, you know, there are, you know, right now, over half of the people in the United States play them every week, they're not going away. Um, they just may get formed and transformed. Um, you know, think about like the reaction, you know, people said that YouTube was gonna kill television. They were so certain that YouTube was gonna kill television. They were not just certain, they shorted all the stocks. The world was coming to the end. YouTube was gonna kill television. You know, who's not watching Breaking Bad and Game of Thrones and all sorts of things? It's the best time in television in 50 years because it reacted to that. And it, guess what? They didn't make it YouTube, the 30 second experience, the two minute experience. You know what television did? It got longer. It got more differentiated. They spent more money. So in a free to play user generated content model, what did HBO do to respond? It's spent more money to create more differentiated entertainment, and it's turning the world on its head. That's where console gaming is gonna go in the future. It's just, but it might not be a console. You know, maybe you'll play it off of a server in the sky, but who cares? You can still play Grand Theft Auto on a server in the sky. All right, another um, big trend we've seen in the gaming industry is obviously the impact that social networks has had on games. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, social gaming companies come out of nowhere uh, with fastest grow is growing revenues that we've ever seen in startups um, in Europe, uh, in, o in the USA as well, and in Asia. Um, you were actually with Elevation Partners, a very early investor in Facebook. Uh, and I noticed that EA, in the, the last uh, years of your tenure, you actually, not you personally, but the company, um, pulled a lot of games from Facebook. Um, what was the reason for that? What was the reasoning behind it? Um, a couple things. Um, well, first off, um, what we did was try to figure out the best way for our games to find a market and to make the best games we could. And from a, from a platform perspective, we thought that what Google and Apple were doing with iOS and Android brought more value to gamers than the Facebook platform did. And it was really a function of touch screens more than anything. Um, the touch experiences for casual games is a great, great thing. And so we thought we got a better experience on mobile looking at both phones and tablets. And the second thing is the, the, the vibrancy of the ecosystem was better. Content discovery was better, and the business model was better. So during the time that we pulled away from social, we grew, not we, I'm not there anymore, but the year we pulled away from mobile, or from social, excuse me, we grew digital revenue 40% that year, from about a billion one to a billion seven. So it wasn't like we pulled away from the idea, we shifted to a more profitable ecosystem where the experiences would be better. That makes sense. Um, so you're investing now, are you looking for any investment opportunities here in Finland? It's a, maybe a leveraged buyout of slush. <laughs> Not a bad idea. I hear it's a not-for-profit organization, though, so it'll be kind of hard. Well, that it might be uh, less expensive than I thought. <laughs> very well, John. Thank you very much for the interview. Thank you.